So I hope you're ready to go on a journey of the new genres of dance. You have already been with me on the first part of this journey. Let's now go on to the second half. Um, as you well know, being MA students, uh, doing this very interesting post-graduation course in dance studies, there is a new energy that gets created sometimes by bringing two different things together. So the third has a distinct element of power and energy. In today's world of classical dance, there are three groupings. The first is the classicist, who stuck to the 1950s version of the grammar, vision and construct of the classical dances. You must remember that iconic scholar uh, Kapila Vatsayan referred to these classical dances actually as neoclassical forms for the simple reason that they were clever reconstructions and hence only fictively classical. Then there is the segment of moderates who are more Catholic and who are more willing to uh, change with the times. Uh, they are willing to change as long as the core is maintained. The core essentials have to be retained. And then there are the contemporaries who are daringly experimental. We're going to go on a journey about some of the work of the contemporaries. Experimentation, as you know, happens in several areas. The foremost is in the telling of stories, which move away from the traditional repertoire or the traditional stories that the dance has been telling. Now this has been happening forever. As the poets wrote about new themes and the dancers therefore had new inspirations. All of this went to keep the art fresh. There is nothing fixed about art neither in the form, nor in the content, nor in its music, nor its presentation, nor in its stories. In any case, once we were dealing with a new and independent India, which had different concerns from whatever had happened in the past, creative dances got more space and more scope. You remember Shankar's Labour and Machinery? that captured the anguish of labor in a new industrializing economy. This was the economy of independent India. Eventually, classical dances also got on to the experimental bandwagon. I say this because you can give me the argument that Shankar's work was creative and classical dances are not. But I beg to differ and in this presentation I'm going to prove my argument. Interestingly, much of the experimentation around uh, secular novel lines was driven by women. Many of them had joined the arts soon after a sound academic background and were therefore familiar not just with art but also with literature. And irrespective of whichever form the literature came packaged in, they were able to pull out the best. Take the example of Maya Rao. She drew the attention of a guru, Shambhu Maharaj, to the Shastra and the textual compilations. She introduced him to the books written by Vajid Ali Shah, Banni and Najo. Both books described the practice of dance in the court. Of course, Shambhu Maharaj was very delighted to know that much of what he dances, uh, danced was in the book. But she also drew his attention to the abundance of poetry, which till then had not been part of Kathak's repertoire. For the first time, for instance, she used for Kathak an Ashtapadi from Jaydev's Geet Gobind, Haridi Hamugdha Vadhu. She also used the poetry of Tagore, the Varsha Ritu excerpt from Bhanu Shingar Padavali. She used it for the Tagore centenary in 1960. So you see, changes happen. After all, it is a parampara. The param has to go par. Even themes changed. In the 25 years between 1970 and 1995, Kathak dancer, guru and choreographer Kumudini Lakya had created over 50 productions that had moved beyond tradition to modernity. In a piece in 1969 titled Variation in Tumri, Kumadini Lakya employed the projection of miniature paintings 
so as to draw out the link between dance and the other arts. The theme of the 1971 piece Duvidha was the conflict between tradition and modernity. She refused to accept tradition as orthodoxy. Some of her other works of this period include Dabkar in 1973, Drishtikon and Chayanat both in 1974, Yugal in 1978, Atah Kim in 1981, Okha Haran in 1990 and Sravan in 1992. They were radically different from all that had been seen on the Kathak stage this far. Not only was the look minimalist, but the choreography was non-linear and abstract, in a sense going away from the much touted description of Kathak as Katha Kahe so Kathak Kehlai. Even earlier, the boundaries of Bharatnatyam had been challenged by none other than Mrinalini Sarabhai, who had learned Bharatnatyam from Minakshi Sundaram Pillai and Kathakali from Guru Kunjugurup. In 1949, she formed the Darpana Academy in Ahmedabad. It was here that she did her thematic experimentations. In her early work, Manushya, using Kathakali and Bharatnatyam, she explored the eternality of the soul. In 1961, it was Tagore's Tashir Desh, and later she was to work on complete abstraction in a choreography called Tat Twam Asi. An empowered woman herself, coming from a family of strong women, she worked on many women oriented themes Shakuntala, Meera, and Chandalika being some. She also did some significant work on the environment through choreographies like Aspirations and Ganga. Later, her daughter, Malika Sarabhai, trained in the classical dance styles of Bharatnatyam and Kuchipuri and a performer activist, was to do bolder stuff in the genre of dance theatre with productions like Sita's Daughters that was outstanding. She also played the role of Draupadi in Peter Brook's international production, Mahabharat. Senior Kathak dancer and contemporary of Mrinalini Sarabhai and Kumandini Lakya, Rohini Bhate not just experimented with music and tal, but also introduced contemporary poetry. Katputli to the poetry of Bhavani Prasad Mishra depicted the shackles women lived with. Interestingly, Rohini Bhate often penned her own poetry when she felt that a piece was not getting the push and power that she wanted it to. Uma Sharma created the dance drama Stri, hailed for its powerful thematic content and artistic presentation. A one-woman exposition, Stri depicted the position of women down the centuries and the search of the woman for an independent identity. Thus, the journey of classical dance to take modern themes, even activist themes, had begun. Many fell victim to this trend, including Pandit Ravi Shankar, who in 1990 produced and directed the dance drama Ghan Shyam in the United Kingdom. It was not only performed in the United Kingdom, but also travelled to the USA. Ghansham told the story of a young dancer who became addicted to drugs. Pandaji did this because he had seen so many around him from the world of the arts losing all to this addiction. The dance drama used mime, stylized gestures and dance. It starred the great Kathak dancer, the late Pandit Durga Lal as Ghansham, who succumbs to drug abuse. The other great artists who participated in the production were the Bharatnatyam legends Shanta and VP Dhananjayan. Ghan Sham used a mixed language of different styles including and naturally Kathak, Bharatnatyam and Kathakali for Dhananjayan sir has been trained in Kathakali as well. Now by now even a form like Kathakali had accepted radically different themes. 
Taking advantage of the fact that the form employs an aharya or makeup and costuming technique of character types, a series of Kathakali productions based on inspiration sources as varied as the Bible and Shakespearean plays were attempted in Kathakali. The International Centre for Kathakali, then headed by Sadhanam Balakrishnan, had a big success, for instance, in Othello. Even Kathak maestro Birju Maharaj produced a brilliantly modern work in Lohe ki Atm Katha that used the lightning pirouettes of Krishna Mohan Mishra to suggest the sharpness of the sword. He also produced a whimsical choreography called Film Editing, in which, struck by the repeated forward and backward play of the tape, he called upon Kathak's concept of Jode ke Tukre to have the dancer spin forward with one tukra and then turn back with his joda. In more recent years, a younger crop of dancers has carried forward the challenges of working on different themes. Some of these opportunities came out of funding opportunities. Some of them came out of new work opportunities. Some came out of challenges. For instance, Bharatanatyam dancer Geeta Chandran worked on a whole range of social issues which came her way from the UN agencies. Some of her contemporary thematic choreographies include her voice and imagining peace which articulated her conviction that dance can be a vehicle to build social bridges. In her voice, she worked with a puppet artist, Anurupa Roy. Important in this category of her work is her work that she did with uh, issues of gender, drug abuse and the environment. I remember in 2008 she did a work called Mythologies Retold addressing the burning issue of female feticide. She also did a piece inspired by Gandhiji titled Warp and Weft. And you don't need any imagination to tell you that she used extensively Khadi cloth. Now the work explored key concepts of Gandhian philosophy through the narrative lens of a female dancer's skills. The choreography played with ideology through abstract movement as well as narrative gestures and incorporated both classical Bharatanatyam as well as contemporary uh, theatre movement. If funding and performance opportunities propelled some of Geeta's works, Rama Vaidyanathan's works on birds, the dance of birds, which was an entire classical margam in Bharatanatyam, grew out of a closeness to friends who were bird watchers. The piece eventually stressed on the disappearing habitat of birds. Change in themes were inevitable and is likely to be the direction in which dance will move in the future. Modern 20th century dancers cannot be shackled by a fixed past that is imaginary to boot. Choices are the essence of life today and we cannot grudge our dancers this. There may be some concern about how far is too far, about when a dance loses its stylistic core for its thematic push, but then the main agenda of the arts in India is transformative and if a work transforms thinking then it is meeting its purpose and as long as it creates rasa through the pathway of the rasa sutra then it still fits the Indian definition of natya the comprehensive art of theater vast enough to be able to contain dance music dialogue costumes and props when Kathak dancer Aditi Mangaldas was selected for the Sangeet Natak Academy Award in 2012, it was for the category Creative and Experimental Dance. Aditi turned down the award, claiming that it was being offered to her for the wrong category. All her work, she claimed, had been in the field of Kathak. 80% of it was in the classical idiom and 20% of it was in a contemporary expression, which is also strictly rooted in Kathak. Whatever changes one saw in her work, she claimed, were harmoniously and homogeneously evolved, serving to help the stream of Kathak expand, rejuvenate 
and be full of energy and life. Yet even she has arranged her work into two sections, classical Kathak choreographies and contemporary Kathak choreographies. Amongst the former are footprints on water, uncharted seas, some Ved, seeking the beloved and immersed. Among her choreographies in the contemporary Kathak, Kathak list are textures of silence, timeless and now is. Her 2013 work Within is described as a mix of classical and contemporary Kathak. Thus, boundaries are neither held sacred nor flouted but pushed organically by each contemporary dancer. If at the helm of bringing in thematic change were women, then at the helm of bringing in a new language of dance that went beyond the familiar kinetics of that particular dance style was also a woman. Her name, Chandralekha. Initially trained in Bharatanatyam by Elappa Pillai, after a few years, she retreated from the dance world only to return to it in 1984 at the East-West Dance Encounter organized in Mumbai by George Leshner, director of the Max Miller Bhavan. The reason Chandra had retreated from the world of Bharatanatyam was because she sensed a hypocrisy in it, she says. She was seeking for older but truer echoes of cultural connectedness between body and soul. She found these connections with yoga and Kalari Payat. She stunned her audience on that occasion with her choreographies, Tillana, taken from her 1961 work, Devadasi, and Navagraha, a choreography she did in 1972 with the great dancer Kamdev, and an excerpt that she showed from her new work, Primal Energy. This was just the beginning. In 1985, she came up with Angika, which included the sequence of the female dancer riding a male, recalling immediately the power and image of Durga. The kinetics of her work were driven by a search for the spine, accounting for her choreographies justly being described as resistive. Even Leelavati, which she created in 1989, was done in a minimalistic manner with a unique oral and movement signature. Subsequent works included Prana in 1990, Shri in 1991, Bhinna Pravah in 1993, Yantra in 1994, Mahakal in 1995, Raga in 1998, Shloka in 1999 and Sharira in 2001. By the end, the Bharatanatyam element had pretty much vanished. A boldness and sensuality tinged the primarily Kalaripayat and yoga-based kinetics. Chandra had succeeded in finding core connections. For Sharira, she used music that had certainly never been used for Bharatanatyam before. She used the sonorous voice of the Gundecha brothers as they sang Jagat Janani Jwalamukhi, an ode to the power of the feminine. At the 1984 East-West encounter, another force was born that flashed like a comet across the sky. This was Manjushri Chaki Sarkar. Regrettably, the flash was short-lived and both she and her daughter, Ranjabati, herself a brilliant dancer, died within a few years of each other. After living abroad for several years and training in modern dance, Manjushri returned to India to develop a new language of dance called Navanrityam. Navanrityam drew on the major classical dance forms along with Chao, Thangta and Kandyan dance. These were its three inspirations. Manjushri's dancers' guild created unforgettable choreographies like Tomari Matir Kanya, a version of Tego's Chandalika, Aranya Amrit, based on the legend of the Bishnois, a traditionally environment-friendly community, Kronchakatha and Paramaprakriti. 
she said, remain Ranjavati's incomplete work. While Dancers Guild continues, that brilliantly creative energy it once had is now sadly dissipated. 1984 turned out to be the turning point of dance in India, or more precisely, one of its most important milestones. It was as if Chandra had unleashed the Kundalini force lying dormant in dance. Post-1984, so many more went exploring the energies and movement vocabularies of other forms to multiply the styles that inhabited the one body. Daksha Seth was an established dancer of Kathak for 20 years, having learnt it from Kumudini Lakya at her school Kadam in Ahmedabad. It was only then that she entered training in Mayur Bhanj Chao, Kalari Pat and the aerial technique of Malakam, including rope Malakam. Malakam is a tradition, a martial arts tradition, physical fitness tradition from Maharashtra. She was also trained in contemporary dance. This unique mixture was to revolutionize her performance. Two things helped her to reach this end. The first, that she was married to a world musician, Australian Devisaro, and the two worked in close collaboration to produce truly unique world. Secondly, she retreated into the recesses of Kerala, far from the madding crowd, which permitted her to develop her work in solitude and without distractions. Both these factors helped her to create unique work that was eagerly awaited. Since 1996, when she introduced aerial techniques, her work has developed the advantage of another dimension as she choreographs along both the horizontal and the vertical axis. Among some of her most important works are Search for My Tongue, which she produced in 1996, Sarpagati in 1997, Falling Angels in 1998, which was an Indo-British production to commemorate 50 years of Indian independence, Bhu Kam in 2001 and Sari in 2010. Daksha's most recent work, Shiva Shakti, created in 2012, draws from tantric mysticism and is about the release of the Kundalini. Italian actor Iliana Chitteristi, recipient of the Padma Shri in 2006 and the National Film Award for Choreography in 1995, has made India her home since 1979. In India, she trained in Odissi with Guru Keluchar Mahapatra. Subsequently, she trained in Mayur Chao for six years under Guru Shri Hari Nayak, earning the title of Acharya from Utkal Sangeet Mahavidyale in Bhubaneswar. From 1985, she has been choreographing works using a mixed language, sometimes Chao and creative, as she did in Narcissus, a solo presented in 1985, or Panchabhuta, which was a group work which she presented in 1996, and Jaraja, a group work that she presented in 2003, which is based on the first chapter of the Natya Shastra, in which she additionally used Thangta as well. The duet she produced in 2006 called Tantra used a blend of Chao, Odissi and creative movement. Iliana helped create Odisha's martial arts festival out of her love for the energetic kinetics of martial arts practices, all of which she has employed in her own work. Like Ilyana, Navtej Johar was an actor before he was drawn to Bharatnatyam. He learnt Bharatnatyam at Kalakshetra first and then with Leela Samson at the Sri Ram Bharatiya Kalakendra in Delhi. 
He studied at the School of Performance Studies at New York University. He has collaborated with some of the best international performance and music artists of the world and has danced at the most prestigious venues. He is always open to new associations and has been part, for instance, of Shiba Chachi's art installations and Deepa Mehta's films. He is known as a cutting-edge choreographer whose work is layered and resonant. He was the performance director of the Queen's Golden Jubilee Parade in 2002. A long-time student of yoga, he trained in Patanjali Yoga with TKV Desikachar. Since 1985, he has been teaching yoga and employs innovative ways of imagining and teaching it. He created an instant buzz with his work of 2000 called Meenakshi, in which he theatrically illustrates the magical attributes of the Devi. The 2007 refined version of Fana Revisited, set as a duet with singer Madan Gopal Singh and singer Ilangovan, was a seamless coming together of the poetry of the North and the South. Another coming together was encapsulated in Johar's 2009 choreography, Mango Cherry Mix, performed as a duet with Japanese dancer Hiroshi Miyamoto, whom Johar described as a familiar other. As both of them were from different countries, admittedly, yet both were from Asia. In Grey is also a color, commissioned in 2010 by the Sangeet Natak Academy, Navtej Johar took a theme based on social inequities based in South Africa, which pushed classical norms really to the margins. Asta Debu has been described as a pioneer of modern dance in India. He was trained in Kathak and Kathakali, and despite all the neutralization that happened as he developed a unique kinetic, post-training in the Martha Graham and Jose Limon dance techniques, and as an apprentice to Pina Bausch and Alison Chase of the Pillobolus of the Pillobolus Dance Company, they still appear in flashes in his work. He has also been inspired by dance in Japan and Indonesia and with the martial art practice of Manipur's Thangta. By interweaving all these different elements, he has created a dance theatre style of his own which successfully assimilates Indian and Western techniques. He has experimented with a variety of forms, themes, concepts, collaborations and even performance spaces. In 1969, he danced in an improvised manner with Pink Floyd at a fundraising concert. In 1986, he choreographed for Maya Plisetskaya, the diva of the Bolshoi Theatre Ballet Company. He also choreographed for M.F. Hussain's film Meenakshi, A Tale of Three Cities. He has worked with hearing impaired dancers and produced road signs with them. At Khajuraho for the dance festival in 2000, he performed with the Gundecha brothers. Celebrations is his work with the Thangta artists. One of his most powerful choreographies for solo performance is Thanatomophobia. In 2009, he created Breaking Boundaries and subsequently in 2012, he created Interpreting Tagore, based on four poems of Tagore, which he presented with the children of the NGO Salam Balak Trust. In this work, he went back to an old partnership with puppeteer Dadi Padamchi that he had first established in 1989. Padmini Chetur, principal dancer and choreographer of the Padmini Chetur Dance Company, was originally trained by Chandralekha many of whose productions she participated in since 1991. In the 10 years that she worked with Chandralekha, she performed the productions Leelavati, Prana, Angika, Shri, Bhinna Prava, Yantra, Mahakal and Sharira. She presented her first solo work, Wings and Masks, in 1999. This was followed by Brown and the duet Unsung. Fragility came in 2001 and Solo in 2003. Her production, Pushed, was premiered at Seoul's 
Performing Arts Festival in 2006 and it has traveled worldwide since then. Now that I've told you something about Padmini Chetur's work, let me also tell you that the reception to her work in India has been somewhat subdued as it is believed that she breaks away too much from the norm. Now that doesn't bother her because she admits that she does so in style and content. Fragility was a piece that she did and that we take as a case in point. It moved very slowly, suggesting vulnerability, but refused to be drawn into a narrative. In all the above examples, more than one dance movement art is contained in each dancing body. They put in a lot of labor and training to get to the point of what they think is perfect. Hence the output is larger than the sum of the parts. Let me also tell you about a recent experiment called Parkaya. The tint of another, as the name suggests, was allowed onto one deliberately, but for a short while. Parkaya had three dancers. Urisi dancer Madhvi Mudgal, Kathak dancer Prerna Shrimali and Bharatnatyam dancer Rama Vaidyanathan. They danced on different evenings. Each danced individually. But parts of each one's performance were choreographed by the other two. Thus, each of the three soloists attempted to expand the boundaries of their art to experience each other's dance forms more intensely, more intimately, led through by the dancer of that form. Now this recalls to mind the ancient thought and practice of transcending one's own body to enter that of another. Hence the title Parkaya. It is evident just as once the twin processes of reform and revival operated simultaneously in Indian dance, especially with respect to classical dance. Today, tradition and modernity walk hand in hand, even in the apparently tradition-bound Indian centers. This is a trend that one has noticed from the second half of the 20th century. Yet if modern trends are not known and not celebrated, then cultural policy makers need to be implicated for following a policy of categorizing art practices, arranging them in little boxes or arranging them hierarchically or in watertight silos so that nothing of one practice goes into the other. When you fund select and limited categories, because familiarity is a comfort zone, you somehow do a disservice to the implicit energies that come when different forms come together to create new genres of dance. Mm -hmm.